Shalom and greetings from the Jordan River Valley. As we continue in the summer of devotions and the Word of God portion, you may wonder what am I doing here? I could be up the road in Jerusalem enjoying a cool breeze, but I'm here in the desert sweating. Well, I'll explain that a little later. Seemingly today, more than ever, there's an attack on the Word of God. In separate conversations this past week, I encountered this thinking firsthand. I spoke with a cab driver, asking him about his beliefs, and he explained to me that he believed that the Bible was for Bible times, but today it's just not relevant. And then after service this weekend, a man who has only recently been coming asked me, how do you know that something that is so old, written thousands of years ago, can still be accurate and true? Well, I must be honest with you. I don't entirely blame this situation on the world, on science, or even mainstream media. Yes, they've each done their best to stop people from believing the Word of God, I believe the problem starts with Christianity. See, we're in a day and age where biblical truths in the church are being abandoned. Where things that were once looked at as wrong are now not only accepted practices in the congregation, but also in the pulpit. How can a preacher that makes his livelihood off of this book think that somehow it declares what was wrong to be right? Because obviously, they just don't believe it. With terms like textual criticism and textus receptus and all sorts of other attacks on Scripture, instead of most pulpits taking a stand, they have cowered under social pressures and believed lies. In fact, let me explain something that is quite frightening. In 2011, a leading information gathering group known as the Gallup Polls in the United States did a poll of random Americans and they discovered that only three in ten Americans interpret the Bible literally, saying it's the actual Word of God. Thirty percent of Americans is all that believe that this is the inspired Word of God. That's twenty percent less than believed when I was growing up, and probably way less than that when my parents were growing up. Here's the problem with those decreasing numbers. A similar poll was taken of U.S. pastors, random from top denominations, were asked anonymously whether or not the scripture we have today is the inspired, inerrant word of God, and the results were alarming. 67% of American Baptist pastors polled said no, the Bible is not without error. 77% of American Lutherans said no, we don't believe it's without error. 82% of Presbyterians said no. 87% of Methodists said no. And a whopping 95% of Episcopalian pastors that were polled said no, we don't believe this is the inspired, unadulterated, pure Word of God. When shocking numbers like that, it's no wonder the world has the view it does on the sacred writ. That's a combined 81.5% of polled pastors not believing this is without error. Like the man asked me this weekend, how can we be sure? Maybe you want to know. Listen, I know it's easy to just, as Christians, say, well, it's faith. We need faith. And faith is a large part of our salvation. But do you really want to risk the choice of heaven or hell on something blindly without really knowing for sure? That leads me to why I'm here in this intense heat. And the answer I gave this man that I spoke to in church this weekend resides here as well. See, last century, this in the centuries before, this area, this land was inhabited by shepherds and their flocks. And in the spring of 1947, there was one such Bedouin shepherd that was here in this area. In fact, the story that I've heard most, it was a, a young shepherd boy that 
got bored with his task and began throwing rocks. Well, if you've ever been a boy and thrown rocks, you know that you need a purpose, a target. His target? These caves right behind me. And after probably several tries, he hits his mark, only to hear bang, crash. So he investigates. When he climbed up, he found a broken clay jar filled with manuscripts. He took them to his father, who later took them to the shoemaker to have some shoes made because they were high quality leather. Upon further inspection, the shoemaker realizes that these are ancient manuscripts. In fact, the caves were filled with these jars. It's a great story with some variations. However they were discovered or however it was determined they were valuable, it has been substantiated that they were so old, even dating back to 400 BC. What were they? The Dead Sea Scrolls, of course. The books of the Bible. And the amazing thing is that with the exception of Esther, every book was there and remarkably accurate to what we had. Now with Esther missing, you may say, do I believe that Esther is not inspired? No. In fact, there were scrolls that just couldn't be read, and quite possibly that's where Esther was, or for one reason or another, maybe it was just not added to that collection. It's a collection that dated back to the first century, after all. The bottom line is when Isaiah states, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. He wasn't. Just kidding. Nearly 1,900 years, those scrolls stayed preserved in that cave. Preserved for the time where the word of God was being attacked so vehemently. Discovered just at a perfect time to show the validity of the word of God. So you ask, how could it be so accurate to today's version? Well, those that made the copies of the Bible were known as scribes, and they had strict guidelines to follow, some of which were as such. They could only use the cleanest of animal skins, both to write on and to bind manuscripts with. Each column of writing had no less than 48 and no more than 60 lines to show uniformity. The ink had to be black and of special recipe to keep it from fading and to allow it to withstand the tests of time. They had to verbalize each word aloud while they were writing as not to make mistakes. There had to be a review of each manuscript within 30 days. And if as many as three pages required corrections, the entire manuscript had to be redone. The letters words and paragraphs had to be counted and the document became invalid if even two letters would touch each other. The documents could be stored only in a sacred place, a synagogue, mostly. And no document containing God's word could ever be destroyed. They were stored or buried, kept in a synagogue or sometimes a cemetery or sometimes a cave. With this handling of the Word of God, they knew its importance of it not being added to or taken away. Centuries, millenniums even, God has been preserving His Word. Simply, His Word cannot be destroyed. Even though many have devoted time to try to stop it, and even dedicated their lives to doing so, it doesn't matter. One such fellow was French writer, historian, and philosopher Voltaire. In the 1700s, he stated that by the next century, there would not be one Bible left on earth. The awesome thing is while he has come and gone, and his writings long ago have deemed outdated, the home he lived in from 1755 to 1760 would later become the headquarters of the French Bible Society, where the holy book had been delivered and distributed. 
as Solomon wrote, the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. It doesn't really matter what a man says, thinks, or plans to refute the word of God. As Paul wrote, let God be true, but every man a liar. Meaning if you aren't standing on God's word and allowing it to be true in your life, you are simply put a liar. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. They say before a science textbook even reaches the school desks that there will be material in it that will be deemed outdated. In fact, if you stacked the science books from just last century that are considered outdated, they would reach miles into the sky. And while they are rewritten and rewritten and rewritten, the Word of God says it is written over and over and over again. It is written. In fact, long before science deemed that the earth was round, Isaiah said this, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are as grasshoppers. The difference being, the Word of God is not man-made, but it's God-breathed. That's why Peter wrote, For the prophecy came not of old by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why God's Word cannot be destroyed by man, because man didn't create it. God did. So wherever you are today, pick up this book. Read it. Love it. Live your life by it and know it is true. Blessings. Thank you so much. Hope to see you next time. I'm heading out, getting in some air conditioning. Lord bless.